This time in Goss's garage, we're joined by Lyndon Abel from Rommel Harley Davidson in Annapolis, and we're going to talk about motorcycle brakes. Absolutely. All right, uh, Lyndon, on cars, we have a lot of different options as far as brakes go. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess partially because there's a lot of discounting of brake pads and so on. We have the old fashioned organic pads and then uh, the semi metallic pads. And the, the thing that is really good these days are ceramic pads. But you've always got people wanting to, the cheapest thing going for one of the most important safety items on the car. Do you have any of that on bikes? Uh, yeah, probably to a lesser degree, and I, I think, you know, certainly we can recognize, and it would be important for your viewers to recognize, that cheapest isn't always the best value. I and mean, if you're going to, uh, I mean, A, it's pretty important that your vehicle be able to stop properly. So if it can't do that, it doesn't matter how cheap the brake pads are, they're just no good. But, you know, if, if it damages the rotor, if you... Uh, have a, a braking emergency that doesn't allow you to stop as effectively and you end up in a wreck. I mean, all of these things are so much more expensive than um, the price differential between a cheap part and the correct part. But um, certainly, I think there are advertising claims that will talk about, uh, you know, this pad does this uh, better than the OE or it's, you know, the same in this area but so much cheaper. Um, in my experience, the manufacturer does a great job of producing a, a part, in, in this case a brake pad and rotor combination, that work extremely well together uh, and work in all situations very well. And, uh, you know, I've experienced people that say, oh, you know, these are the pads that they use when they're racing. So they're, you know, they're, if they stop race cars, they're obviously much better. Yes. But in a race car application, you may have a pad wh whose main goal is to survive the heat demands, the extreme heat demands, uh, and not come apart. So, in fact, unless you're at racing temperatures, uh, they just don't stop effectively at all. Or you may have a pad that stops fairly effectively in dry, maybe even better than the OE pad in dry conditions, but add water and it doesn't want to stop at all. Or it works well with the rotor that it was intended for, but it doesn't work well with the OE rotor. So, you know, just like you say, you want to use the right tool for the job. You know, in this case, you want to use compatible components that are designed to do what you need them to do over all of the uh, applications that you need them to do it. So you want brake pads that can stop when it's dry, when it's wet, when it's hot, when it's cold. All right, now, one of the things that we see with cars uh, there are a lot of cheap brake rotors. Now these rotors have almost no carbon in them, so they're soft as anything, and they don't feel all that bad, but they groove and they wear down. Sometimes you'll go through two sets of rotors for one set of pads. Yeah, it's, it's false savings, right? I mean, you, you end up uh, saving a couple of bucks on the front end and paying it back on the back end. And I suppose, you know, where you'd want to be worried about this is somebody that's trying to get a vehicle through inspection and then sell it. So they want to use the cheapest things possible. But, uh, you know, while you can find parts that will be an improvement over the uh, original equipment product in some cases and in some applications, you're rarely going to go wrong with using the, the product that was designed for your vehicle. They just, they go through so much testing that an aftermarket supplier just doesn't have access to. All right, now you brought a couple of uh, motorcycle rotors, Harley rotors. Yeah, here. so this is the, uh, a rotor on a, um, a, you know, an original equipment rotor for a Harley Davidson motorcycle, a newer style one and the brake pads that go with it. And this is interesting. This is a polished version of this same rotor. And you look at a polished rotor and you think this is... It, it can't stop. It can't stop, right? <laughs> right? I mean, the coefficient of friction is gone. Um, you know, this one has a, a lot of these small machine marks, which, um, you know, even when you run your finger across them, you think, well, they really add to the friction um, that this pad is going to be grabbing onto. But w what you find with this polished rotor is that uh, once you have uh, the pad set in on the rotor, 
uh, it, it doesn't look too dissimilar in the swept area, but it's still so much more attractive in the other areas. And after a short period of time, it stops um, very closely to as well as this. Now, the first couple of stops are, are pretty slippery, but uh, once it's broken in, uh, they stop quite effectively. Okay. Now, when you do a brake job on a motorcycle, now on cars, we have very specific, and I mean incredibly specific break-in procedures. Same thing with motorcycle pads? Same thing. Uh, uh, break-in is important. Uh, I've used certain pads that required a very aggressive and very specific break-in process. If you followed that, you got uh, the product as promised. If you didn't follow that, uh, you ruined a perfect, you know, a an otherwise good set of very expensive uh, brake pads. Um, yeah. The 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 break-in procedure on Harley Davidson pads is is not aggressive and not difficult. But just like everything, you know, if there is a break-in process, follow it. Why would you, you know, waste all of that good money and not do something that's very simple to do properly? All right. Now you say it's not aggressive for cars. It's use the brakes lightly for the first 200 miles, for the first 20 miles, you can make uh, multiple gentle stops. But the old school business of stomping the pedal, making these panic stops, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, well, then it's uh, very similar. So um, the same thing. I don't know that the mileage is quite as important. Obviously, it depends on the temperature and things like that, but you want to do uh, gentle stops at first while they're seating together um, and then because of the way brake uh, disc brakes are designed the pad is running you know lightly against the disc when the vehicle's operating so you know that just running it helps the brake in and uh, after a few gentle stops and a few miles you can begin to be a little more aggressive on them and uh, they will do a great job. Other pads uh, you need to do uh, you know, specific warm-up process because what they're wanting you to do is to apply some of this brake pad material to the brake and then the the friction is is the pad material against the pad material that's now attached itself to the brake rotor. But uh, stock pads, uh, stock rotors, no. Okay. What else do we need to know about uh, motorcycle brakes? Um, I think that probably the, the most overlooked thing with motorcycle brake systems is probably exactly the same thing that's overlooked with cars, and that's the <laughs> brake fluid. Yep. Um, Harley's for many years ran with DOT5 brake fluid, uh, but uh, in different models it switched in different years, but for the last several years they've been running DOT4, and DOT4 absorbs water just like a sponge. And uh, there's this notion that the brake system is a sealed system and therefore it never needs to be flushed. And that's just wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, they do what they can to keep the atmosphere out of that system. But the fact is that water gets in there. There are specific testers for this. If you have more than 4% uh, moisture content in the brake fluid, it must be flushed. It's, it's no good and it will cause harm to your system. Um, if you look at the brake fluid, you can't tell. And every time you take the cap off, you're adding a little humidity in there, unless you live in Phoenix. Mm. Well, I think the thing that people don't realize is that once the moisture gets in there, uh, water boils at 212 degrees, mm -hmm. brake fluid, uh, naturally, without any moisture in it, boils at 410 degrees or something like that. And what happens here is in a panic, stop when you can't afford anything to go wrong you hit the brakes you hit them hard you stay on them and that moisture boils turns to steam turns to steam, steam is essentially and air and very compressible yep you got and it you got super squishy brakes when you most need them to be stiff yep exactly so you recommend how frequently on brake fluid two, two years. years same two years. as we do on cars yep yeah, every and that's two years. Regardless of mileage, I mean, you can make a case that if your bike lives outdoors, it should be changed more frequently. And if it lives in a, you know, moisture-free environment indoors most of the time, it could be changed less frequently. But you're not going to go wrong with uh, every two years, and brake fluid just isn't that expensive. Yeah, it's not like it's a, a major operation. 
All right, well, Lyndon, how can people get in touch? Uh, phone is 410-263-3345 or website rommelhd.com. And if you have a question or a comment, how about dropping me a line right here at radio at goss-garage.com.